Welcome to section 3.3, Measures of Central Tendency and Dispersion from Grouped Data. All right, so we've only, in 3.1 and 3.2, we've only looked at data that was raw data, or if it was in a table, just we had discrete data. So each class was just one number. Um, so sometimes when we're given the data, it's already in a histogram whose classes are intervals, or it's in a table whose classes are intervals. So in other words, we lose the raw data. So how can we calculate the central tendency and dispersion if we do not have raw data, but we just know the, the interval of numbers something is in? Okay, well, let's, let's look at a situation that has this going on. Let's do a histogram. And let's draw this histogram very exact because we're going to be using this data together. So here's our frequency. Label your axes. And then let's have our consecutive lower class limits just be this. Okay, so again, just to review, um, this first class, these are consecutive lower class limits. Oh wait, hold on, let's draw the histogram first. So let's have this first class have a height of three. The second class have a height of four. And then a height of five for the third. And then back down to three for the last class. Okay, so essentially what we know is that this first class, this is consecutive lower class limits, and so this histogram bar represents three observations that are 10 to 19, okay? So we don't actually know. They could all be 10, they could all be like 18, they could be like 11, 15, 17, we don't know. All we know is that three observations are between these two numbers. So how could we possibly calculate a mean if we don't know the observations? Because remember for mean we have to add up the, all the observations. Okay, so how we get around this is we do this. We assume all observations in the class take on the value of the class midpoint. So the average. So let's do all of the class midpoints. So remember, it's um, consecutive lower class limits divided by 2. Add them up divided by 2. So 10 plus 20 over 2. And then we see that the class width is 10. So we can just add 10. All right, so now what we're going to assume is we're going to assume that those three values take on the value of 15. And we're going to use the class midpoints to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. So um, let's look at this. If we wanted to calculate the mean, whoops, mean, remember the symbols we use for mean? Mu for a parameter or a population, and then x bar for a sample or statistic. So again, what we're saying is that we have to add up all the observations. We are assuming that all the observations in a class take on the class midpoint. So we are assuming that there are three observations with a value of 15. So we have to add up 15 three times, 15 plus 15 plus 15 to calculate the mean. But let's use multiplication. Multiplication is a shortcut to addition. And then likewise, next, we're going to assume that there's four observations that have a value of 25. So we have to add up 25 four times. All right, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that is adding up all the observations under our assumption. And then we have to divide by the total amount of observations. And it's three plus four, plus five, plus three. It's the height of the um, histograms, histogram bars. Okay, so um, you can put that in your calculator. Order of op operations, you might have to put in some parentheses to make sure you calculate that correctly. But we should be getting um, 30 
6.3 is the mean. Okay, and so let's scroll on down. Essentially what we did, if we wanted to use our fancy summation notation, we added up, it's a sum, we did the frequencies times the midpoint and then we divide it by the total frequency. Okay, um, and then going down here, that's exactly what this notation is. Um, the frequency, whoops, the frequency is the F1, and then the midpoint is what they're calling X sub I, and then they, the total frequency adds up all the frequencies. Okay, so we have a nice, a nice formula for that. Okay, so we are also going to do use the midpoints to calculate the standard deviation. And here's our formula. So again, it's like um, the same concept. We looked at the standard deviation from the mean, right? So distance from the mean squared times by the frequency of that class. All right, so this is the midpoint. And then we divide by the total frequency. And for sample standard deviation, just as before, we have our degrees of freedom, so we subtract one. All right, so really similar situation. And we're gonna practice, we're going to do it by hand once. So if you guys wanna practice by hand, go ahead and push pause, and then come back and see how we did, see how you did. Okay, so we can first fill in the class midpoints. We already calculated all that. This is the same data as before from our histogram. Same frequencies as well. So we have to do our class midpoint minus the mean. So 15 minus 30.3. All right, so negative 15.3. And you do that for each class midpoint minus the mean. And we get something like this. All right, and then um, we square it. So for instance, here we square the negative 15.3 squared, we get a positive number, times the amount of observations in that class. And you do that for each one. So again, hopefully you push pause, now you're just checking your answers. So again, we square the 14.7 and we multiply it by three to get this. Okay, and then um, we add up this column, that's what this is telling us to do. And notice this is the same. So this is telling us to add up the column to get this. All right. So in our calculation, notice we just did, we're doing um, sample. Yeah, we're doing sample standard deviation. We just found that. So now all that's left to do is divide this number by the frequency minus one. So the total frequency is 15. So really what we're doing is it's going to be the square root of the sum of that column divided by 15 minus 1 divided by 14. So our, sta our sample standard deviation is 10.6, um, 10.6. All right, and then just another quick note, we're using the table to help organize all of our numbers, if we wanted to just use our formula and take sum after sum after sum after sum, we could definitely do that too. And in that case, without the table, just to give you an idea, it would look something like this. And then when we simplify it out, 
then we would still get the same answer. It's just a different way of organizing the information. It's all the same information though. Let's see, do I have enough room to do everything? All right, and then again, what I'm writing right now is optional. You don't have to do both. You would get the same information. It's just a different way of looking at the same thing. Sometimes it's nice to be able to go back and forth. All right, and then finally, of course, we would take the square root of all of this. And if we had to put that, were to put that whole thing in our calculator, assuming order of operations are correct, we would still get the 10.6. Okay, so um, we did it by hand once, so from this point forward we can use our calculator. You're going to see the calculator instructions in the video down below, um, but for now let's go ahead and look at more examples. So really what we're doing when we're doing group data and finding the mean and standard deviation, it's really a weighted mean, right? The midpoint of each class is weighted by how many observations are in that class. It's gonna have more weight, that midpoint will have more weight if there's a lot of frequencies. It will have um, less weight in how it affects the mean if there's not a lot of observations in that class. So we can also talk about weighted mean in this section. So Similar definition, so x1 could be considered the midpoint, and then w, that used to be the frequency, but now it stands for just the weight. All right, so let's look at this example. Bob goes to, by the way, nut store and creates his own bridge mix. So he combines one pound of raisins, two pounds of chocolate-covered peanuts, and one and a half pounds of cashews. The raisins cost $1.25 per pound, the chocolate-covered peanuts cost $3.25 per pound, and the cashews cost $5.40 per pound. What is the cost per pound of this mix? Okay, so it's helpful to know, um, just kind of write out your units. So we want to know the cost per pound. So our final answer has to be in terms of dollars per pound. Okay, so this is going to help us about what's on top and what's on the bottom. So we have to essentially find total cost on the top and then total weight on the bottom, really similar to that weighted mean formula up there. And that will give us our solution. Okay, so total cost. So we're going to have to look at the total pounds we buy. So for instance, let's consider the total pounds of raisins. We have one pound of raisins, and raisins are $1.25 per pound. So we have to buy one pound of something that costs $1.25. All right, and then we're going to add that to, let's see, two pounds of chocolate-covered peanuts. And the chocolate-covered peanuts cost $3.25 per pound. So we need two pounds of something that costs $3.25. All right, and then finally we have one and a half pounds of cashews. Cashews cost $5.40. So we need one and a half pounds of something that costs $5.40. Okay, and then this is all over that's going to be the total cost once we add it up. And then the total weight is we're buying one pound of raisins, two pounds of peanuts, and one and a half pounds of cashews. All right, so let's uh, throw that in your calculator. Uh, be mindful of order of operations. So we might have to put the numerator and denominator in parentheses. And we end up, we can round to the nearest penny, and we get 352. To get full credit, remember it's the, this is going to be the cost per pound. Total cost on top, so it's going to be dollars on top. Total weight on the bottom is pounds. So the solution is 352 per pound, and it's a weighted mean. This is essentially a weighted mean. Okay, so another example of a weighted mean is actually how, in our class, we calculate our grade. At the, in the syllabus, we have the grade breakdown for the semester. Um, and different 
uh, categories have a different weight. So for instance, we have homework is worth whatever percentage, it doesn't have that much weight, versus the final exam, which has the most weight of the class. It will affect your grade the most. The homework will probably affect your grade the least. So um, in this course, we have that attendance counts for 5% of the grade, quizzes count for 10%, exams count for 60%, and the final exam co counts for 25 and then we have Mar Marissa's value. She had 100% average for attendance, 93% for the quizzes, 86% for the exams, and 85% on the final. And we want to know Marissa's course average. And this is how we actually calculate our average as well. So um, remember when we're doing percentage of something, it's the percent times the weight. Percent of a weight. So 100% average. So it has to be in our decimals. So 100% is 1 of something that's worth 10%. So remember, of in math means multiply. So this is literally saying 100% of 10% of the grade. Whoops, except it was 5%. Sorry. Let's erase. Double erase. And I'm just not letting me erase. Okay, we'll just start over. So it's 100% of 5% of the grade. All right, and then for the quizzes, it's 93% of 10% of the grade. And then 86% for the exams, which make up 60% of the grade. And then finally, she got an 85 on her final. So 85% of the 25% will go towards her final grade. And then we're going to divide this by the total weight of the class. And they all add up to 100%. So throw this in our calculator. Order of operations, of course. Double check to make sure you can do that. And we get point at 8715. Um, in other words, that's an 87.15% overall. And that's her grade in the class. She's going to get a B. All right, so moving on down, uh, we have another example. We have group data. This is taking us actually back to our first two examples. Um, but we're going to use this to show us how the calculator works. And then we get to use the empirical rule as well. So we're going to do that in the video down below.